Welcome, everyone. Nice to have you. Um, I want to make sure that we're in the right spot. You are at Events in the Face of Climate Change, Promoters, Performers, and Communities. Nice to have you. Uh, just briefly, I'll mention that if there's any reason we need to evacuate the building, there's an exit that you came in in the front, one in the corner by the elevator, and then one in each of these corners, and the mustering spot for this building is behind the building in the parking lot. I think that's all we need at the moment. I'm going to turn it over to Patty Reagan. All right. Thanks for coming to spend an hour with us. Uh, my name is Patty Regan. I live in uh, Jericho, Vermont, but my uh, job is I'm the production manager of, of the UVM Recital Hall, and I run a small music festival called Waking Windows, which uh, happens every year in May in the wonderful town of Winooski, Vermont. And um, I am just going to let these folks introduce themselves, if that's okay. You'll, you know more about you than I do. Um, and we'll start with Molly Stone from Catamount Arts. How much should I say about it? Okay, light description. Excellent. My name is Molly Stone. I live in Bradford, Vermont, but work in St. Johnsbury, Vermont, as the artistic director at Catamount Arts. And I've been there with Catamount since September of 2016. I'm Rose Friedman. Uh, I run the Civic Standard, which is in Hardwick, and I live in East Hardwick. Um, it is a small nonprofit that is dedicated to making excuses to get people together, and we do that through a variety of ways. I'm a theater director, so that's a big one. Um, we have a weekly community meal. We have an open door on Main Street. Um, we put on a variety of events in every venue in our town. <laughs> I'm Sammy Levine. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I live in Burlington and I am the events manager at the Intervale Center. Um, as an agricultural based nonprofit, we do build community events into our mission. So I host um, summer, like a summer music series called Summervale. We host Wintervale events. Um, and then I also do a lot of our um, private fundraising events as well as wedding rentals. Cool. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, I, what I wanted to sort of start the conversation out with was um, maybe talking uh, a little more in depth about what you do as uh, in your role in each of the organizations and how uh, what you do has been impacted by changing climate, whether that's the floods, whether that's there's an argument to be made that. COVID is an uh, outcome of changing climate. And also, uh, Sammy, I know you had a little run-in with Tripoli this year. So uh, I think each of those things would be worth uh, diving into. And uh, yeah, and I think we can uh, interject if there's something that comes up. Feel free to have a conversation about it. So we'll start with you. OK, so I'm trying to remember everything that you prompted us with. So if I forget something, just kick me. Um, so I am the artistic director at Catamount Arts. An artistic director could mean all kinds of things depending on where you're at. Um, but the majority of my work is booking, producing live performances. So some of the slides that have come up, not that one, um, is my, my mobile stage up at Dog Mountain. And climate change has affected us greatly, not just in the, in a, a direct, very obvious way, which is the flooding, well, flooding in 2024 that hit St. Johnsbury was very much localized on St. Johnsbury and Linden. And we received about eight inches of rain. It was six to eight inches of rain overnight within a span of about three to four hours. So it completely changed the landscape and destroyed uh, certain places, bridges, railroad bridges, roads. Uh, in the matter of hours, and we woke up to a whole, ooh, whole different uh, climate, or just yeah, just landscape. Um, but also, uh, and, and I'll we'll get to that too. I'm sure more of that. But also, the 2023 floods, which did not affect the NEK, it affected Montpelier greatly, Barrie, um, and other places centrally. Um, and so we had a discussion amongst ourselves at Catamount and with the Vermont Arts Council about the state of philanthropy in the 
in, in these emergency states that we seem to ha be in often and how uh, dollars that usually go to the arts were then going to flood relief. And so we weren't affected immediately in 2023, but folks will make choices with limited amounts of money where it's gonna go. If it went to flood relief in 2023, it might not come to one of our nonprofits in 2024. So just thinking in the future, like how those dollars are gonna be allocated. So we still don't have an answer on that, but it was a, a question and we in 2023 obviously didn't know that 2024 was gonna give us the same event on the same day. <laughs> wow, um, that was just, what a, what a kick in the, in the pants that was. Um, but also at Catamount, um, not only the climate change, but also just environmental damage that occurred years prior. So we, are, we purchased the land around us with the buildings. We had to have an environmental uh, investigation and they found that we had lingering dry cleaning chemicals in the air in the building that we were working in. And so in 2023, June 2023, we were immediately asked to leave the building. And so we had to relocate for an entire year in an empty Sears at, at the mall. Um, so in, in the span of a year, we lost our building. Um, our staff was kind of displaced. Uh, the flooding two years in a row and uh, we continue to program through it all. That said, um, continuing to program and to ask people to fund it, uh, it is not sustainable. Um, there's our venue up at Dog Mountain. Uh, so yeah, it's not only the immediate climate change, uh, things that are happening uh, weather-wise, but also things that are in the soil that we now have the, the ability to uh, clean up and find. Um, that we're now dealing with as well. I don't know if other folks have had environment issues like that that have happened in the past and now we have to deal with them. Um, but yeah, in addition to that, that's something that we've dealt with. Is that kind of That's great, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Good start. I feel like, um, I feel like we could dive into so much of that, but let's, I think what we'll do just to sort of frame things out is we'll go through each of, uh, each of your experiences and then we'll start sort of comparing things. and. And let's uh, sort of towards the end, we'll talk about sort of future uh, plans and how funding will change and that sort of stuff. But yeah, Rose, let's hear about the last couple of years of your um, crazy existence. <laughs> so uh, we're in Hardwick, which was hit uh, real hard in the 23 floods. Um, and we are located in the oldest building on Main Street, which is the former newspaper headquarters for 100 years. It was where the newspaper was housed, um, which then was shuttered by COVID. Um, newspaper almost died. It's, it still lives, but it's only online now. So they felt like they didn't need this big building. And I say all that just because I feel like we're we're living in a, a greater context of like huge upheaval and change, um, and shifts in in bigger um, issues around like municipal funding and um, media and like bigger questions of safety and um, how we relate to each other in community. Um, just before, just between Anna's speech and this panel, um, I got a call from our town manager to just talk about this meeting that happened last night about flood resilience and, you know, and he was just calling to vent uh, about his feeling of overwhelm um, and how hopeless it sometimes feels that, you know, our town needs $100 million of engineering work to protect it from future floods and he feels like all he does in his job is, is just the bearer of bad news. Um, and that it feels overwhelming and hopeless sometimes. Um, so when we're talking about these cultural events and these gathering spaces, it's just in this bigger context of this huge upheaval moment that we're in um, and the, the feeling that a lot of people have of hopelessness. Um, and then there's also this bigger context of people not seeing each other uh, as full human beings, which is also what we're working on a lot in our work. Um, so. Our little organization, you know, I thought we were going to lose the building down the river on um, in July of 23, um, and I went down there. It was pouring rain at about 5 p.m. with a little prayer of, "Could you please wash the building down the river now before we own it?" Um, and it, that did not happen. <laughs> and then we became the owners of the building um, on the last day of 2023. Uh, it was donated to our organization. 
So now I pray for it to stay. <laughs> this is a different prayer now when there's a flooding event. Um, but that, that little building, is, which is in pretty rough shape, um, is on the river side of Main Street. And, um, and there's a big chunk of land that's been taken out right there, right underneath us. So it's pretty sketchy. Um, and you can see one of the slides that's going through is of the motel uh, in Hardwick that, you know, the land just came right out from underneath it. So the response to that major moment of catastrophe was for us to continue to do what we're always doing, which is to try and be in a conversation with the town and to listen to what is needed and what feels appropriate. And that is, um, feels to us like uh, often just pivoting whatever we were doing. So at that moment, we started doing a lot of free food, delivering it to people whose houses were impacted, delivering it to volunteer groups, putting out volunteer calls, being the kind of hub of organizing in that way, setting up the emergency shelter up at the high school, just like whatever random things were popping up. But then we also felt like it's very easy and sort of, um, lucrative to go into nothing but emergency response in those moments and to say, oh, well, like theater isn't really that important right now, um, but it is. And so at the same time that we were doing that kind of um, real needs-based work, which of course got us lots of accolades and thank yous, we were also thinking about the work that we do, the artistic work that we do. Um, and so we were building shows and things very much in response to that moment that the town was experiencing. So a couple months after we did a, a haunted house experience in an abandoned garage in town, which we can't call a haunted house for insurance reasons, but it was, um, it was a haunted experience. <laughs> and, um, and, the, and in that garage, which was a very beloved property to the town, so it was like a meaningful thing for people to be invited back into that space. You know, we were, the, the portal that opened into that haunted garage was, was through an object that we said had washed up on the banks of the river during the flood. And so there was this weird object that we made that then when people interacted with it, it was like, oh no, what have you done? And then the garage door opens and you're pulled into this sort of alternate universe. And it's just like any way that we can process <laughs> at all the different levels of our brain, the crazy trauma that's happening all around us all the time is, is important. And it's as, as important as a free community meal and shelter on the night of the flood. Um, but thinking about safety, it's also a really intense conversation to be in. And so we're always sort of looking outward and saying like, is this okay? Are you okay? How do you wanna be part of this conversation? Um, and pulling as many people into that as we can. All right, I'm trying to think about the three main things when I think about my job in relation to climate change. The first is just kind of less um, like traumatic, chaotic events, but just climate change in general. Um, we have an event at the Intervale that's happened for you know, 15, 20 years that's called Wintervale and it's completely based around cross-country skiing. It's like a free day for folks to come, you know, test equipment, be in the snow. And that's just not something we can rely on having. Like we can't have a event based around snow in Burlington. Um, so on like, that's kind of the least traumatic version of this thought process, but just like, how do we shift that, right? Like if we wanna host this event, if we wanna be a space that folks um, can recreate outside, uh, how do we shift that? And this last year we, you know, tried to create it as skiing as an, op an option if the weather permitted, but really tried to like shift that to be just an event about outdoor recreation. We had a chili cook off, we had, you know, Vins come with a raptor presentation and outdoor winter tracking walks and all of this. So just kind of, um, like that shift in thinking of, right, we can't depend on what we've depended on forever. Um, and then on the flip side, if you did wanna have an event that was all about snow, you know, how do you create an event that's so nimble that it can be like, okay, this event's gonna happen at the first snow. And how do you communicate that? How do you 
uh, you know, market an event that doesn't have a date that happens around a weather event. So thinking about things like that. Um, and then also everything I'm gonna talk about is gonna be a little bit through an agricultural lens. Um, so a little separate than maybe exactly what today is about, but um, the Intervale is a home to seven organic farms. We work with farms all across the state and we're really uniquely located between the Winooski River and Lake Champlain um, in a place that is historically like the best farmland, right? It has historically flooded once a year, leaves that silty loam top, like that's what we want for flood or for farming. Um, but unfortunately, because of that location, we were majorly impacted by both um, flooding events in 2023 and 2024. Um, the, you know, basically the 360 acres of stewarded land by the Intervale Center that's home to a lot of the farms that provide food for our community were fully flooded, millions and millions of dollars of loss there. Um, and while that's, you know, not directly my role, our whole organization shifted into emergency response. Um, so talking about like still putting on theater after flooding, it's like, I was not doing events. I was out there harvesting as much food as we could get out of the ground before. So again, like that nimbleness and shifting in priorities while holding, um, you know, community gathering and community celebration as really important. Um, and um, yeah, putting like a disaster response in action. After the 2023 flood, we spent months putting together a you know flood response plan and unfortunately in 2024 got to learn that it was a great response plan um but we didn't think we'd have to put it into action so soon um and then within each program you know having really specific like really really specific instructions of like what we would each do um in response and along my roles it was like communicating with anyone that had rented the space, if there were public events happening that week, you know, how are we canceling them? If we're, and if we're um, continuing to open the space to the public. And the Intervale Center is historically a really important green space um, and celebration space for the city of Burlington. Um, and then lastly, I'll just talk about EEE because that's the newest um, fun thing to add. Um, was a public safety, you know, we all experienced it, but it came out from the state health department to cancel all public events that happened after 6 p.m. Um, if possible, to move them inside, if not possible to, you know, be really well protected. Um, and we unfortunately did have to cancel the last two weeks of our Summervale series. Um, and it was, it was not a hard decision to make because the Intervale Center as being in between two bodies of water that's flooded twice in the last two years is kind of mosquito haven. So we in good conscious, um, you know, invite families and children down there to recreate. But the conversation, you know, that quick decision was easy, but the conversation around what that means for um, outdoor events in the future is really interesting. Great. Uh, I just want to say, uh, I think these mics are going to go in and out, so we'll just sort of like plow through as yeah. they as they go in and out. I can just no, yeah, you're, you're <laughs> all doing great. Um, I think that that's a, uh, there's a couple of things that came up in each of your um, uh, descriptions of what's happened that uh, makes me think about the, um, the sort of uh, path that we as a society have, have sort of taken into climate change, uh, you know, arguably back to industrial revolution. But um, I'm wondering from each of your perspectives, and we can continue to go down the line if that feels good, um, but, you know, either um, positions you've been put in by past organizations like having, um, having uh, dry cleaning stuff in particulate in the air or um, 
you know, the design of Vermont towns around these like uh, town centers being right next to rivers or the floodplain. And um, am I right that the um, Intervale was a, the dump for a while? Is that true? Yeah. So, uh, you know, you're dealing with these like decisions that were made, you know, out of probably financial uh, need or just trying to like, uh, you know, Burlington was a smaller town. They had a dump. It was in this land that nobody thought was great for farming, or they probably knew, but it was cheaper to put it down there. So I'm just wondering how, uh, and maybe you can take this further than this question, but like how is that impacting the way that you can move forward and the way that you look forward to events? And that um, brings to mind for me like a funding, uh, how each of your organizations are funded and how that funding goes to um, making those decisions. There was a, a part in Anna's talk about um, uh, looking ahead. Uh, I know that's an ineloquent way of saying it, but basically like how does the, um, the sort of uh, scale of time and the passing of events like affect uh, what you're doing moving forward? We'll start with Molly, I guess. Yeah, so I, it, that just made me think of, okay, so, um, yeah, the historical, uh, the, the, uh, all right, let me try to regather my thoughts here. Because I was thinking something after, after what you said about, you, you said cancellation at least 10 times, and I feel like we're in this culture, new, new era, it's the cancellation era, which began with COVID, where, Yes, yeah, I, I thought of the cancel culture joke, but I left it on, on the table. Um, and you picked it up and said, isn't this funny? Uh, we should go on the road. So yeah, the, the new cancellation culture and how that is affecting us as an organization, I mean, that began with COVID. So we became very comfortable canceling events, actually, Rose, you were the first event that I canceled. Um, that was a big moment, one that I actually took a photo of and documented, and I know the exact date, which was March 14th, 2020, where I canceled the second installment of a trilogy series of, of Punch and Judy, which was heartbreaking. And then as you move forward, the heartbreak, it, it changes into what Anna was talking about, which I really enjoyed the graphics and the language, um, that, which will offer me a, a way to look at these things going forward. Now that I think we've learned our lesson that the cancellations are gonna still happen, continue to happen for different reasons. Now we've had COVID, we've had, I mean, and I didn't even mention that we were kicked out of the, the temporary space that we were in before we could get back into our building. So we had to move into the Cal Rec, which is the newspaper. And that's a whole other discussion about how the community supports folks that are displaced during these times. And we have a really good relationship with our town and our surrounding communities where they were offering us space to go, offering us space to put our equipment during these, these times. Um, yeah, I, I don't even know where I'm going. I got so emotional. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's a different offshoot of the conversation. But I, I won't talk about funding. That is not my wheelhouse. That's our, our executive director, Jody Freed. He has kept us funded and going. If this man were here, he would speak on behalf of that. And it would be su such a, a wonderful thing to listen to um, because he knows what he's doing and he does look forward. As for us looking forward, and I think going back to what Anna said and using the language and you know planning for the future, now that we know that we're gonna be canceling things, um, as, you know, for, for other, and now EEE is the new cancellation um, issue. Uh, how we deal with that and how we protect our our organizations from going under. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there to be inspired by what you do say. <laughs> this is not cutting out. What you oh, sure. Yeah, that sounds yeah. smart. Um, so the, let's see, the timeline and, um, let's see, timeline funding and what was the other sort of general oh. heading? Yeah, in an unknown time, yeah. Um, so 
one of the things that I'm holding in our organization's um, sort of brain is uh, that the infrastructure and physical aspects of what we are um, shouldn't be as important as our relationships with the community. And it's very easy to get sort of pulled into um, like historic preservation of our beautiful little Main Street building and have that kind of take over um, the actual mission of our organization, which is to get people together. So, uh, you know, in that way, I feel like we're holding certain things really lightly um, and trying to keep this idea of these relationships and um, people's joy and hope being the, the most essential component of our work. Um, and that is uncomfortable <laughs> uh, because it's very, it, it feels very good sometimes to like close the door and just like focus on making the space really pretty and writing grants for it and having meetings about it and stuff like that. Um, and it's much messier, stranger work to figure out like why aren't these people coming to this show and um, why is this person making this other person uncomfortable at the community meal and how can we sort of put all of this together with these unpredictable, strange human beings that we live amongst. Um, so, so that there, in my organization, I feel like there are these two distinct poles in that way, which is like physical infrastructure reality and then the strange cloud of, of human activity. Um, so our, so our sort of funding approach and, and everything, because we do so many different things, um, but in such a small location, um, we, we are just trying to um, walk this very delicate line of trust. And uh, so funding for us is important because there's a number of people in town who have great distrust of nonprofits. Um, and so we have to be careful <laughs> not to become um, like a, a nonprofit machine that is, you know, recognizably um, the same as so many others before us. Like we have to continue to be of the town and speaking um, with the town and not lose sight of that. So it makes funding into a, a little dance, a little ballet, um, and people are somewhat you know, questioning of like, how do you have this money to like give away food? Um, and so while a lot of people are very appreciative, other people are like, that is super suspicious <laughs> that you're giving away food um, and you shouldn't have that much money. So we're trying to be as transparent as we can, but it's really pretty straightforward that we're just another scrappy organization that's just asking for donations, writing grants, um, and you know, asking like the beer maker in town if he will support the community meal, and asking the cheese maker if he'll support the play, and you know, it's all it's all there. Um, but the <laughs> but the cancellation culture, I want to also just speak to and say that I find that as much of the time as we're dealing with the questions about is the weather going to be okay, is there a sickness that we need to watch out for. Is there a flooding danger? We're also dealing with cultural um, questions of is it gonna be safe? And so um, we do a lot of events at the Legion um, in our town. And when we first started doing those, um, there were a number of people in the community who were concerned about their physical safety in that building because they hadn't been there before. And their assumption was that it was um, going to be a lot of um, angry vets who were not going to tolerate, um, you know, anybody who didn't look just like them, basically. Um, and they were afraid of violence in the parking lot, and they were afraid of being intimidated or bullied on the dance floor. Um, so, so that kind of thing, you know, there's moments where in the middle of the night, I'm like, I have to just cancel the dance. I can't deal with it. Um, but, you know, it, it has been, um, a beautiful experiment of proving itself over and over again and there's just a constant you know we try a thing and we're just like um, security guards in a more sort of intellectual way um, you know we're not actually like bouncers ready to throw down but we feel like we are creating this unseen space um, in and amongst people 
um, which takes a huge amount of emotional energy, actually, um, where you're just smiling and like moving around this room where people are together. And you're doing a kind of a, a gentle correction all the time without actually correcting people's behavior. You're not actually telling people how to think or feel or live their lives, but you are demonstrating in your every movement that you're okay, I'm okay. You can be that, I can be this, and everybody's okay in that same space. So there is a sort of a weird safety thing that I feel like we do, like a dance that we do in that space. Um, then that's the thing, that's, that exhaustion of that is the only thing that has made me close to canceling an event, is that feeling of unsafety. We have somehow skated around all the other stuff so far. Yeah. I just want to add before it leaves my, my brain that in terms of funding, um, for, for us anyway at Catamount Arts and thinking about this into the future, we aren't because we're in the middle of it right now. I mean, just because we're speaking on a panel about our experience doesn't mean that we have an answer or we're working through the solutions. We're not. We're still working to get ourselves back on our feet after the, and yeah, the destruction of 2024 and all the shifting that we had to do. We're still in the middle of trauma. So I just wanted to, to make that clear. Like we don't, we don't have the answer at the moment. We're in the middle of it still. Thanks both. Um, I definitely resonate with that like uh, responsibility or like feeling of you know making sure everyone is safe and also making sure everyone is successful. Um, like Patty's definitely heard me this season. He did the music booking for Somerville, and you know if it was a chance of rain, I'd call him up and be like, Patty, like you know what if no one comes and none of our vendors make any money or sell anything and. So there's, there's a lot of responsibility when it comes to creating a space that's you know, safe for guests and, and for businesses and folks coming down to, to make money, to have a part in the community. Like it, it has to be safe for everybody and it has to feel valuable and successful to everybody. And, and there is a lot that you hold as someone that manages that. Um, that I am constantly trying to learn to like release some of because a lot of it is out of our control and then what is in our control we can you know do our best to to support so just wanted to share that I resonate a lot with that um, and then as far as like scale and funding and future thinking um, just to note right like if the inner veil hadn't been a dump for however many years it was a dump and the first 10 years of our organization existing. It didn't have to be a compost facility to like reinvigorate the soil down there. Like how much farther ahead uh, the organization would be able to be supporting farms and agriculture and, and events and all these things throughout the state. So that like time scale and, and thinking ahead and what Anna mentioned about like creating, you know, it, it takes time to create interdependent communities. Um, we should just always be thinking so far ahead and and also everything that we're doing now is is creating those spaces in the future um, so that's my thought on time scales and funding again similar to Molly I won't speak a ton about funding because I tend to get lost in it but um, something you know post post flooding we pivoted to a farmer recovery fund. So the intervale for, you know, many months after each flooding event was not raising money for, you know, the budget that we still have to raise money for, our nonprofit budget that exists. It shifted to um, a farmer recovery fund. So everything was going to intervale farms. And, um, you know, I think that's, this year was about 200,000. Last year was about like $350,000 raised. So that, just thinking about how that like emergency, that emergency response is in addition to like budgets that already exist and how, how do you build in like that resiliency and how do you build in a, a revenue base that like you can get through a year where, you know, 
some of a portion of your funding just has to go to emergency response. Um, and thinking about, you know, people with fundraising or donation fatigue, right? Everyone donated to the flood last year. We saw a way less amount of donations come in um, after 2024's flood. And so how are we like as communities building in, um, you know, building in something that's gonna keep folks safe through these, through these floodings and where is it a nonprofit's responsibility to, to raise those funds? Where is it a town or a state's uh, responsibility to raise those funds and how do we like allocate that um, emergency response and support um, is something I think about a lot. <laughs> And I'd like to note that Noah Khan did not do a flood relief concert this year because we didn't have a flood apparently. Mm -hmm. um, and Fish did not raise money for flood recovery either. So you know, it, flood uh, philanthropy for recovery is in fatigue and sometimes it's on trend, which it was very much on trend in 2023. So thinking ahead, we're not gonna have the, the big Vermont stars putting themselves out in front of large audiences to save us, they're only gonna do that once. Um, I think what uh, I took from that uh, mostly was the, uh, like you were saying, Molly, sort of like the still being in a state of crisis, still responding almost in a day-to-day, -day, uh, in all of the things that you're doing, you know, it's still, real, it's still present. Um, uh, and so I was gonna ask about sort of like future plans, but it feels like um, almost insensitive to ask about what's happening in the future when you're st so focused on the present. So what I think, Rose, you were talking about the community and, and we've, uh, we've talked a little bit about community, but I think something that's so important is how we bring people together and in um, in crises, community comes together not around uh, shared interest, not around shared uh, financial standing or anything. It's like you are now suddenly a community member next to someone who acts, looks, thinks totally different than you, but you both need a meal or you both need somewhere to stay that night. So I'm wondering um, how how can you, uh, and maybe, maybe this isn't quite on topic for the talk, but I, I find it interesting, like how can uh, the actions that we do as event organizers uh, help, um, help do that, maybe not in a time of crisis, or, or maybe uh, uh, in a time of crisis, but sort of use that period to sort of mend some of those differences. Uh, does that make sense and feel like something that you wanna speak on? Yeah, I think that's it's part of resilience in, in general. Like we do that, I mean, we are very mission-based at Catamount. Our mission is to integrate arts into community. We do the summer series on Dog Mountain, which you've seen um, evidence of that up here on the slides. That whole series is based on um, a lineup, a diverse lineup of music genres. It's free and open to the public. It has no barrier to participation and it is meant to cause social friction on the lawn, meaning, and by social friction, not arguing, but people, you know, shoulder to shoulder, because they've come out for a free, very partisan uh, event. So they're all on the lawn, and you have different, you know, economic statuses, different political statuses, people come out to the lawn because it's a good time. Um, and there's no ticket to buy, and there's really, the, it, yeah. So we've been doing that since, well, that series since 2017, but that's always been our, our mission at Catamount. So that is the investment into people, which we, we just do, and I think probably a lot of nonprofits do. Like, that's what they do. So that actually gave us the, the people power to get through the events that we had to get through, like being offered the newspaper office building when we needed a place to put our laptops and work, to be offered the hockey rink in the next town over in Linden to produce our series that 
couldn't be at Dog Mountain because of the flood damage. So, and those are partnerships that, you know, we, they're, we're not paying for them. It's in kind from folks who really are invested in our mission, our, and, and our, our organization in general. So that wouldn't have happened if we didn't put in that investment, if that wasn't our intention anyway, for the last 50 years. I mean, we we're celebrating our 50th year. Um, so that wouldn't be there. So that people power, um, which you spoke about, Anna, is so crucial to what we do. And yeah, you gotta let go of the infrastructure because it's, it's not gonna be there. So if you have friends that have a hockey rink and say, set up your stage, a temporary stage in the hockey rink for the duration of the summer, so if you have to use it, you can go in and quickly use it. Well, who knew that we had to use it four times this summer? And if we didn't have it, we would have had to have canceled those shows. But yeah, that's all I'll say. Like, yeah, that investment into community um, is, is what really saved us this summer and kept us producing and bringing people together. Um, yeah, a part, part of uh, why we work the way we do is because um, not everybody in our town will come to the same place. Um, there are places that are off limits, um, sort of culturally, for certain people in the community. So as much as I wish that I had a little theater, um, and that's like still a dream that I can't seem to let go of, um, it, the problem with that is that then I'm just so focused on getting everybody into that one space. Um, and I also am really committed to doing theater in unlikely spaces. So you know, putting something on in the Legion Hall or in the big field at the edge of town um, and, and bringing people there um, it has turned out to be this incredible gift of necessity because, um, you know, people are, the, the longer we're doing this, the, the more people will extend their comfort and come to the place that they wouldn't um, have come before. Um, but just hopping around and saying this one's over here at the diner and this one's at the town hall, um, you know, we, we gain some people uh, from that spot and we also gain this depth of relationship with other organizations and, and um, you know, little volunteer boards and business owners um, and other people working in our town. Um, the other thing I, I would say is just that, that getting people together thing and getting them to step outside of the same circle that they walk every day with the same people who are in agreement with them or who they're comfortable with, um, that that feels like something that we are trying to practice all the time. Um, and that we saw, you know, that when we did a big, big show this spring before the first flood of 23, um, that, you know, right after the flood, then there was like a community meeting that happened in the same space and it looked really similar because we did a like a murder mystery dinner theater and so there was we had dinner long tables in the legion hall there was a fake um sort of development presentation and powerpoint by a fake pseudo developer talking about how he was going to destroy the town there was a q a afterwards and then the fake developer dropped dead and that was like the, the setup of the show and then who who killed the developer oh it turns out anybody in the room could have killed the developer because we all had a reason to hate him right but <laughs> But the idea of that was like, we're all at these long tables together and we're talking about this thing with real stakes. It's fictional, everybody knows it's a game, but we're talking about our town and we're talking about, does it matter? Like what if there were huge high rises all over the town and what if there was um, a helicopter ski resort in Hardwick and like what if we lost all these things and we got Whole Foods, would we still be the same town? And so that we're talking and talking about it in this fake funny way. Um, but then three months later, we were sitting at those same tables, eating the same meal, spaghetti and meatballs, <laughs> you know, in the same space with a lot of the same people who had been in the show playing fictionalized versions of themselves. The town manager played himself and, you know, and then there he was actually being the town manager and actually talking about this thing with real impact, this thing where infrastructure in our town had been destroyed. And a lot of people were like, this is so much like the show. And that was like the life of practice of, you know, I mean, that's not why I do theater. I, it's, not, it's not like an educational do-goodery thing. Um, I'm, I'm there to entertain the people. But 
it, there was a beautiful thing that happened there in, in that relationship, which is like, oh, we know how to do this. And so it feels like that thing that Molly said, of like, you know, we, we need to be together in the, in the good times, the bad times, right? Like, it can't just be when it's really desperate. Oh, you're the person who lives next door to me. It needs to also be joyful and continuous and just an ongoing conversation that we're all in together. I want to come to the next murder mystery oh, yeah. dinner. Well, <laughs> yeah. you just repeat the question for me very quickly? <laughs> yeah. 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 So building like authentic community, right, is really important and and such a beautiful part of the work that we get to do in events is like taking a restaurant where we used to work and have friends and then we have a vending opportunity and then they get to come down and then we get to share this music together and 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 then when it floods that same person texts you and is like hey do, does the team need lunch you know um yeah after the flood after each flood, we were able to feed all of the farmers at the Intervale for um, about three weeks this year and almost two months last year just based on donated meals from connections that we had with different restaurants in town. And, and um, you know, luckily we're in a place where those businesses were able to to donate that and and had the financial resiliency to you know bring a meal down once a week and and everyone just brought it once right like each connection that we had just brought one meal for 30 people but because of the connections that, that we've built real authentic connection like we were able to feed folks for two months um and that and it was so like the interval after the flood is just like a disgusting buggy bog and all of the farmers are able to come up you know to the center we're a little bit you know a little bit up the road right out of the floodplain and just like sit and have lunch together um and it was so beautiful to like then build the relationships between the interval center and all of the interval farmers this like large agricultural community um and it was reflected back that that was so great for them to be able to like have this space to kind of be separate from where they were for the for the lunch hour and share a meal together and um yeah i feel a little rambly but just seconding the importance of like real real human connection and and building those when it's good and bad um I uh, just want to express my appreciation for the fact that you all create spaces for people to, to have those human connections. So I think it's really so important. Um, and um, I had like a 30 second conversation with Tucson a few minutes uh, earlier today. And uh, he brought up the idea of Afrofuturism and, and the idea of it being sort of an imagining of a better future or a more collective future or a more beautiful future. And I think at this point, it may be unfair to ask you all to say, you know, what would, what would, you, what would your dream, like uh, tell us your dream future. Um, but instead, I think maybe something that might be a good way, and, and I, I know we have 25 minutes left and I, I wanna sort of leave some space for some questions in case that is appropriate. But maybe in the last couple of years or just maybe sort of in your life as a producer of events or a creative individual, 
is there something, is there like a, uh, an anecdote or a story or an event that makes you feel like imagining a more beautiful future can come to uh, reality? Uh, and maybe that's a big question, but if, if you feel comfortable um, uh, answering that or giving a, a, an example, that would be great. I'm not ready to answer yet. I need to think a little <laughs> bit further. So, counterparts? Uh, I mean, I always like look to the future and look back at the same time because there's so much back there that's so inspiring to me. Uh, and I am not so egotistical as to think that I'm inventing anything new that hasn't already been done. Um, so I'm very inspired by a lot of uh, arts and cultural movements that have come out of like the hardest times in human history. Um, and the civic is totally built on the back of like the WPA project um, and, and Hallie Flanagan's work and building civic theaters and there's still those civic signs across the country. Um, and you know that was a time of so much <laughs> upheaval and um, so much unemployment and building these beautifully resilient little theater companies that made sense for each community that they existed in is really inspiring to me. Um, and the Black Panthers break free breakfast program was also like a, a cornerstone for me of the civics um, beginnings um, and still exists very much in all of our meals and food programs. Um, and Apple Shops work in Appalachia. You know, just like reclaiming um, our cultural heritage and reclaiming what it means um, to exist in a sometimes really traumatizing environment, which is sort of America, um, but also is very much this, this era that we're in right now um, and how we build joyful systems and ways of seeing each other. And, and again, I just feel like more than any building, it's just like the way that we help each other is the thing that always gives people the most joy in the world. Thank you. The moment that I can't stop thinking about from our summer veil season this past summer was um, Patty booked a band called The Bubs, which is like a moshy punk. 12 person super fun band and Somerville is a super family friendly event there's a lot of young kids and um, I've been calling it the baby mosh pit but there are all these young kids just like so free and like running into each other and like having so much fun and just that like to me that's not music that like young kids are always being exposed to maybe in some households not in mine and it was so fun, and that, um, those are like the really beautiful moments for me are just um, people being exposed to culture and community and, and things that they, they aren't, and um, I think there should be more baby mosh pits, and I think we should all be babies in mosh pits sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> and whatever that means to you. <laughs> I love a good mosh pit, by the way. I've been in several, barefoot actually, once at the Whiskey A Go Go. Um, I've had so much, all of us at Catamount, the staff, everyone, the volunteers, we've had great feedback. There we are, there's Dog Mountain. Um, great feedback from folks. They're just so thrilled. They were thrilled to be back on the mountain um, when we, we actually came back. We had two, our two last shows were at the, the mountain. The two shows before that were at the hockey rink. Anyway, such great feedback. And I can't think of one specifically right now, but what I can say, which makes me really hopeful for the future, is what COVID brought in what the flooding has brought to us, you know, in, in terms of our response as human beings relating to others, is authentic authenticity. Authenticity to me is such an important thing to have amongst people. Um, I think it, it empowers us to uh, accept each other and ourselves and all of our faults and to embrace each other as we are and not as who we want to be or others to be. And something that our series this year, I mean, we continuously try to improve our series, not in terms of music, that's secondary to what the concert series at Dog Mountain is about. 
what is first and foremost is that, and this came up in conversation, I didn't really think about it this way, uh, and even though we were considered a signature event by Vermont Travel and Tourism back in 2023, we do not program, nor do we plan our lawn activities and activation and groups on the lawn to entertain tourists. And we never have, and I've never thought about it that way. We do it for us. So we have Kingdom Recovery on site, the St. Johnsbury Community Hub. These are both organizations that we have had people, classist people, rail against, but we bring them to the lawn because we know that those are integral to our community, and that's where we all belong together and they were able to speak to the crowd on behalf of the, the, their organizations. So authenticity on the behalf of the, the, the mission behind the event, um, and then welcoming people in an in, in authentic manner. So the invitation isn't just, here, show up to this thing, that would be great. It's actually, we want you to be at this thing, um, or else it's not going to be great. So. Long story short, I think our authentic approach to life amongst each other has just been, has just grown exponentially since we were brought down to our knees, to our knees during COVID and now during this flooding. And it sucks with a capital S, but the response has been very beautiful, which often happens out of tragedy and trauma. Um, I just hope that we can continue working with that philosophy, uh, being the wind in our sails in times of beautiful, non-stormy weather. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. Um, if I can share a little um, sort of something from my world that um, I, I view as being a realization of imagining a better future inspired by some of Rose's work and the um, community of Johnson, Vermont that hosts a community pizza bake during the summer. Um, I live in Jericho in the school behind me. There's a pizza oven and that goes, that sits unused most of the year. And um, my partner and I started uh, a community pizza bake in Jericho and we uh, didn't come up with the idea. Standing on the shoulder of giants, as they say. Uh, all of us are like carrying a torch forward. And being able to do so and being able to envision that feels really like important and empowering. And uh, yeah, I'm just happy to have been able to play a role in that community building. Um, I wonder if we want to do Q&A or if there's something, the three of you, if there's anything that like you feel you want to say uh, in this, uh, to this lovely audience that we have here. Q&A, let's do that. Um, does anyone have any questions for us or answers for us? <laughs> yeah. It doesn't have to be Q&A. Can, you can both be Q'ing and Aing. Um, so I guess I have two thoughts. One came very early on, Molly, when you started speaking, and one came later on as kind of the ensemble of experiences, opinions kind of came to light. The first had to do with sustainability, both for ourselves as organizations and event planners in the midst of all of this uncertainty and how that takes a toll on the, I'm going to say givers, but we are also absolutely the receivers of the exchange of energy and community. Um, so that's kind of on the first side. And then on the other side, um, how do we then, as we start to get comfortable in our roles of continuity with what we do and sharing the love of what we do, how do we educate and get the public on board with that same level of uncertainty to say, it's gonna be different, but please show up because we want to be this. We don't want to be the same. We're changing in the in in response to, um, but there need that. I feel like that needs to be part of the of the exchange and and that building community, so that we're on the same page. Does anyone want to dive into that? Yeah. 
Uh, I was just mentioning to Patty that that's what we talked about over the phone when we were talking about me coming on this panel. That's all we talked about. Yeah, yeah. That's all we talked about because the givers, and, and I'll, I'll preface this by saying a lot of times, and I even get it from our own executive director, is that we need to, you, the show must go on and you can't show that you're, you know, you're even teetering because of this. You're there to give your folks an event, a place where they can unwind and have a good time. And you, who are also going through the crisis with your audience, need to get up there and be the leader. But when you're in crisis and trauma, you know, I know very personally, because I, I, book, I book all the vendors, I book the bands, and now I'm holding all of their emotional baggage on my shoulders because they're waiting for my answer about, are we going to be indoors or outdoors? Are we going to be at the hockey rink or not? Because it makes a huge difference who's coming out when I have to shift. And, and bands who are looking forward to being at Dog Mountain, I have to say to them, I'm sorry, you're not going to be there. You're going to be in a hockey rink. So what, what can we do for ourselves and our staff and our volunteers? And, and we're, this is being talked about at a national level too. What can we do for them? Not enough, by the way. But what can we do for them to maintain their, their, their mental health during these times where they are taking on the crisis and the trauma and then integrating it and making sure what they say out to the audience is not gonna increase their trauma. So how do we take care of ourselves? What is built in to take care of us as the givers? And at this point, I can say on behalf of Catamount, because I'm very authentic, is that we don't have that built in. I did not feel that support at, at all this summer and probably not, neither did our executive director. No one did and it's nobody's fault. It's just we've never dealt with this many uh, wrenches in the gears until just now. But I don't think it's a conversation that we have, we need to, we can't put it on the back burner because some of us will walk away. Uh, burnout is a thing. Um, I can't remember what the second question is, but I'm gonna pass it on to my colleagues here because I know they know what I'm talking about. Yo, yo. Yeah, and I won't talk long, but like we, we had to very quickly build in messaging that was very, very much deliberate and in, in how like, okay, we, we didn't know if we were gonna make a call about a venue change until three days out or not even until the day before. So how do you, how do you talk to your folks about, like, we don't even know where the event's gonna be, but it's gonna happen, we just don't know where, I mean, how, yeah. I mean, I don't have an answer. I can say briefly something I, you know, on a personal level, and it comes, can come into conflict with an organization, with a nonprofit, with an image, with a brand, all of those things is like, to me, like, I want to be really transparent in my communications with people coming to an event. I want to be like, hey, wear long sleeves, it's buggy, right? And that's admitting that, like, you might be uncomfortable, or that's admitting that like the venue is buggy, but that's gonna <laughs> make everyone stay and be comfortable and enjoy themselves. And um, I've found that that's a hard one to to switch when you are working for an organization that you know has to fundraise and has to be really presentable in in some aspects. Um, so like the transparency, right? Of like, hey. Everyone's having a hard time, us too, but like it's still important to be together and to gather. Um, that works for me, but I don't know if that works for everyone. I don't think I have anything to add. We can yeah, yeah. question. You know, I, um, I'll add a little bit about Waking Windows because it's a small organization. There's no full-time members. Uh, there's no full-time employees. There's four of us that run the festival right now in 2022. Our budget. We did our biggest festival that we had ever done coming out of COVID. We were, we had grant funding from shuttered venue grants, and we were very excited to do a very big festival. And it was sort of a, 
a gradual, uh, it was a continuation of what people expected from us in the festival. It was three days. Our budget was uh, up near 300,000. And it was the like worst weekend of my life. Uh, and likewise, my co-organizers. Uh, it was r so stressful. Uh, I don't smoke anymore, but I was like chain smoking cigarettes in the bottom of the parking garage. I was just r really struggling through this thing and not, not processing any of it, just sort of like putting little band-aids on things as things were going. And so in 2023, we didn't announce the festival, uh, in, uh, which we usually do in November of 2020, like the following year, November, we say, we're doing it this day. We didn't announce because we were all still so sort of worn out from it. And when we finally came to the conclusion that what we wanted to do was still host an event, but it was gonna be quite different, uh, what we wanted to do was gonna be quite different, uh, we communicated via social media and our email list. So to our, to people that we already had an established relationship with, we were able to say, uh, that was too much. We don't wanna do that anymore. It doesn't feel right for us. So we're gonna do this smaller thing. And our, you know, I, the reason I say the budget of $300,000 was because in 2023, our budget was $60,000 and in 2020, or it was like $50,000. So we're operating like basically a totally different event. Um, and the expectation, and it's a small group of people who run a for-profit business that, you know, that's just a label. There's no profit involved really. But um, we were able to authentically say, we're like, we can't do that thing anymore. And and I think the difference between that and then having an organization that has an agenda or a uh, set of standards that they have to keep up is quite different. That you can't, like, you can't jump on and say like, I as the producer of this event am burnout and I think we should do smaller things, but there's, uh, we got this great show coming up for you. You know, like, I think it's, uh, they're, they're um, at odds with one another. So I think, uh, that isn't a great example. That, uh, that doesn't answer your question, but I think it's, yeah, yeah. So I think it's just um, a means, uh, uh, end of thought. We'll move on. We have a question here. Okay. Yeah, this is sort of, it's a bit of a pivot of something you, you just said, but it actually goes back to um, something that Rose was talking about. Um, and I guess the question is about, on the highest level, about collaborations within communities. but. Um, so some organizations are very community-based and are not housed somewhere. <clears throat> some organizations have a building, um, which is our responsibility to steward. Um, and, um, and I love the line which I wrote down, uh, preventing historic preservation from taking over the mission of the organization. That's not always an option. Um, I should introduce myself, I'm the brand new ED of the Opera House across the street. Um, <clears throat> so thank you. But it is, it's, it's a huge part of what we're doing over there, and yet we want to be building community. Um, and, and so I guess my question is both, you know, some of you all have stories where housed organizations in your community, whether it was the, you know, whatever it was, the hockey rink or whatever, were, could um, collaborate across a community with more community-based organizations, and I think that does, that has value for both. Um, and I'm curious where, you, how you think that can move, how can we build better collaborations between those of us with buildings that are three stories above the floodplain, um, <clears throat> and those of you who, you know, I live in Burlington, I live, I can walk to Intervale, um, you know, who are underwater, um, whatever the water is. want to say first of all I'm failing at fighting off the preservation job like I, I am doing that <laughs> so I'm trying talk. not to but I, I am I'm doing not allowed that. to fail but let's talk yeah again. and I mean that's just the reality of like insurance is not going to continue to carry us if I don't fix the roof and I don't paint it and I don't fix the foundation and so I'm I'm very carefully going down that road but I think the important thing is that in my conversation with my community that I'm not seen to just 
be doing only that and, and losing sight of the actual mission of the organization. And there is, a, you know, a kind of a, a thing, a culture in this state uh, of fixing up old buildings and then the whole idea of what they're used for kind of sometimes getting lost or not necessarily retaining its important piece as the central reason why we're even fixing the building to begin with. And then the building gets fixed up and it's beautiful, um, but it doesn't necessarily feel like the same building to a lot of people in the community. Um, so we've had people come to us and say like, don't do that thing where you make it all creamy, you know, and it looks all beautiful and fancy with the recessed lighting. Like, please keep it the way it looks because it is part of the downtown picture. And, you know, a lot of people are annoyed that the paint is flaking off, but they also don't want it to be too nice. So you're like walking this very delicate line of the different parts of the community, um, you know, and there's, a select board member who is annoyed at me all the time, I think, because I'm not making it more creamy and beautiful. So I'm doing that dance of like, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna fix it and I'm going to not fix it too much and all of that. But, but at the same time, I think that, that that piece of collaboration is sort of the most important thing because, um, because there isn't enough infrastructure and it's impossible to have a building. Like the miracle of being given that building is the reason why I have anything at all of physical structure. I would never have had the capital to actually purchase something. Um, and I'm not going to lose the organization to the built. Like, I'm, you know, it, that's, I'll throw away the building and have nothing in order to keep the organization. And that is just important for me to remind myself of over and over again. And there's lots of great people, thinkers, artists, and small organizations that don't have that door on Main Street. So, I mean, part of what we do is just try and make it available for use all the time, and it's basically free. Um, and so a lot of, there's like a lot of small projects that are kind of starting there that are using it as like a nest to figure out, like, is there something bigger that they want to grow, or is it enough to just hold a monthly event and we can sort of help to house it, we can help with snacks, we can help with publicity and things like that. Um, but then also going to other places so that we don't become super precious about our cute little spot um, and that we bring a ton of people into the diner on a Thursday night for trivia and like she just has a, a great bang in dinner time and her staff is tipped really well. Um, and so that there's just that, all those extra pieces of, of like spreading, spreading the wealth and spreading the joy to all the corners of the community and it becomes that culture of abundance rather than competition. And just on the, and just to continue where Rose was, um, yeah, from where Rose was talking, um, the spreading out into the community. So if you have a building and you do programming in your building, which you do, um, then you know finding partners out in the community where you extend your programming would be a great way to make friends. And honestly, it comes down to making friends, making making good friends with your community to find out what those options are and being a visionary as well. Like, if, you know, if, if you're not a visionary and you're not thinking, um, how can we collaborate? Um, you wouldn't necessarily come up with the idea of going to the local hockey rink and saying, can we use it during the summer when you're not using it for ice hockey? So it, it takes that outside of the box thinking as well. And a plug, and by the way, Catamount Arts, we have a building, but we don't have a performing arts space in that building. So we have to go out in the community and use St. J Academy, Linden Institute, the Vermont State University, uh, Johnson and Linden campuses. We're always out in the community because we literally don't have a space to do the shows that we do. Um, and then a shout out to the Vermont Arts Council and to the Vermont Creative Network, which they have been doing so much work on behalf of, of fleshing out the philosophy, not the philosophy because it's, yeah, I'll just, philosophy of the creative economy. I mean, it's very real. The creative economy is not just the folks that do the creative arts. It is, it, it really involves all sorts of cross-sector partnerships. So the more you can dive deep into that, what does the creative economy look like and who is actually involved in it, and it actually involves a lot more people than just the people who are on stage, 
you start to then make those natural uh, connections with you know who you can partner with you know partner with a local resort they might have a space where you can put on a, a show or something and then that creative event will bring business to them and boy will they be pleased that they uh, got involved with with the creative sector so yeah I guess that's that's all I had to say Thank you. okay it's 12.31, which means we're all finished. I just want to say thank you for being here and listening to this conversation. Thanks, Molly, Rose, and Sammy. And thanks to all of you. And uh, I think we're going to have lunch here in a minute. That's happening. It's great. So you can just stay put. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much.